want to take just a moment at the beginning here before I dive in to uh, give thanks, if I may, in an audacious way uh, to, uh, on behalf of the church, to you, Michael, and you, Marla. Don't know where Michael went, but to thank you, Michael, uh, for all of your good work and your good and faithful service in the church. It's really a blessing to have served with you both, and I'm grateful to you both. Let us pray. It is good and very good in the beginning. God sees it is so. It is celebration at the end. Even at the grave, we make our song, Alleluia. And in between, every moment is sacred. In between, every bush is burning. In between, all shall be well. In between, blessings. Amen. Well, let's have some fun, shall we? I want to take you back to the 80s for just a moment. And what was the best part of the 80s? You'll have to get Nick at night for this, so you'll remember since you weren't there. Uh, the best part of the 80s was sitcoms. So I want to tell you a little bit. So scene one, here it is. It's a friendly bar where everyone knows your name. And there's a young baby face bartender. He sees a woman walk into the bar through the door, and she has this look on her face of, where have I landed? The post pubescent bartender completely remembers that experience, so he jumps over the bar, walks over to the woman, and says, hi. And the woman very suspiciously, if not annoyingly, stares at the lad and says with no emotion, hi. Welcome to my first meeting of your next bishop. <laughs> Scene two, a comedian is dutifully working on writing, and out of nowhere there's a knock on the door. Then the door flies open and the person glides into the room like they own the place. And they say, hey, what are you doing? And then it's followed by a list of question and rapid response. Welcome to living next door for two years to your new bishop. Yes, Diana and I, first introduction was very much like that scene in Cheers. And yes, living next door to Diana at times very much like, felt like I was in a scene in Seinfeld. And yes, Jennifer, Sister Jennifer, you get to play the role of Elaine, in my mind at least. <laughs> at least this is my story, and since Diana had the wisdom, or actually not, to ask me to preach, there you go. So here's the thing, all humor aside, those experiences and our time together in seminary were completely transformative. Diane and I were a couple of very, very young seminarians from the Pacific Northwest, growing up just a couple hours apart. We're both small town, small church kids. My mom was the senior warden of the bishop's committee. Her mom, Betty, was the organist. While we came from similar educational and socioeconomic backgrounds, Diana endured levels of sexism and racism that I was completely oblivious to. So you can understand why she was suspicious when this gregarious white boy came up to her and was all friendly. The other thing, the more we began to hang out and chat, it became increasingly obvious to me that Diana was really smart, she was really wise, and had a deep, incredible sense of faith about her. So gifted, and here's the thing, she was completely unaware of that. Your persistence, Diana, as you have shared, opened your eyes to how you were gifted, how the Holy Spirit worked through you. That was my persistence. Your persistence opened my eyes to that which I had not seen, and how important it was to really see others, which began me on a long and continued journey in my own work around sexism and racism. Your persistence, my persistence, I was able to see 
and you were able to see. Well, friend, as you know, I see you. And when I don't, you're the first to tell me. The good news, though, today is the church sees you. The church sees you in ways that they should have seen you long, long, long ago. And now through the work of the Holy Spirit, because of you and through you and from you, others will be seen. This is a good day for the church. This is a really good day for the church. Brene Brown writes, to be seen, to see and to be seen, that is the truest nature of love. The energy that exists between people when they feel seen, heard and valued, when they can give and receive without judgment, when they derive sustenance and strength from the relationship. That's what it's like to be seen. That's what it's like to see. And Mother Teresa reminds us that when we see God in each other, when we really do that, that's the place where we will find peace. Yet maybe the most poignant words about seeing comes from our gospel today. Here in the latter days of Jesus' teaching, Jesus makes it clear yet again how we are to be in relationship with each other. Lord, when was it that I saw you? hungry, thirsty, naked, sick, and in prison. And Jesus proclaims, you saw me. When you can see that, you see me. If we're truly going to follow in the way of Jesus, if we're truly going to live in the way of love, we need to widen our lenses so that we can really see people. This is why we commit in our baptismal covenant to seek all persons. And yes, we know that's only half of the promise. We are to seek and to serve. Jesus was not just challenging his followers to see those who were hungry and thirsty and stranger and naked and sick and in prison, but to respond, to feed, to give drink, to clothe and to visit. The call is to seek and to serve, to see and to respond, for in doing so, the kingdom of God will come near. When we see and respond, it's fertile ground for transformation. You and I know that, good friend. You and I know that. So as such, Bishop-elect, for just a few more moments, you are acutely aware of how important seeing and responding are to the transformational work you are called to in this season of being the bishop. The great Quaker educator, author Parker Palmer suggests this. The human soul doesn't want to be advised or fixed or saved. It simply wants to be witnessed, to be seen, to be heard, to be companion, exactly as it is. Your call you have been so persuaded, is to join now as companion with the good people of the Episcopal Diocese of Oregon. Not to fix them, not to save them, but to see them and to invite them to see each other in a way they haven't, in all their diversity, in all their cultural and contextual realities. To see the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers in their midst, to see and discern to respond in the formation of the followers of way of Jesus. Yet as we know, that is only part of your call, serving as bishop, walking with as companion, because it is just as critical for you to see and invite good Oregonian Episcopalians to see their neighbors, the folks on the other side of the red doors, the streets of this great city, the fields of the abundant lands, the coastal towns, the college campuses, communities large and small, God's beloved children in this amazingly beautiful and diverse world of the Episcopal Diocese of Oregon are filled with people we are not seeing. And that is why it is so abundant and clear that God has called you to these faithful folks in this season of the 11th Episcopate of Oregon. 
You truly know what it is to not be seen on both sides of the red door. And you know what it's like when your gifts are not seen, not affirmed, not encouraged in their fullness. So your call, my friend, as bishop and as companion, is to seek and invite, to seek and serve, to see and respond, serving as bishop, walking with as companion. There is no doubt in my mind, friend, that the kingdom of God is going to come near as you and these great, wonderful Western Oregonians in the Episcopal Church really truly see and respond to each other, really truly see and respond to your neighbors. Following the way of Jesus, following the way of love, transformation is coming, a beloved community is at hand. And because you and I have this thing about sharing quotes, I have two-ish quotes to share with you on both ends of the spectrum. Wisdom, I think, that will be helpful for you, I hope, moving forward. The first one comes on the elder end of perspective from John Lewis. Study the paths of others to make your way easier and more abundant. Lean toward the whispers of your own heart. Discover the universal truth and follow its dictates. Know that the truth always leads to love and perpetuates peace. Its products are never bitterness and strife. Clothe yourself in the work of love, in the revolutionary work of nonviolent resistance against evil. Anchor the eternity of love in your own soul as it embedded in this planet with goodness. Release the need to hate, to harbor division and the enticement of, of revenge. Choose confrontation wisely. But when it comes your time, don't be afraid to stand up, speak up, and speak out against injustice. And if you follow your truth, the road to peace, and the affirmation of love, if you shine like a beacon for all to see, then the poetry of all the great dreamers and philosophers is yours to manifest and to become a beloved community. And then on the other end of the spectrum of good wisdom from the younger end, for there is always light, if we only, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. Those words of Amanda Gorman, may they always ring true for you and for this diocese. May we live like this. May we see each other for who we are and for what we are. May we face each other, seeing and being seen, loving and being loved. May we see all of each other. May we see all of us. May we be seen. Let us pray. God of the journey, the light by which we see, the comfort when we stumble, the word that lifts our hearts, the footsteps we shall follow, be our companion through this day. The blessing of the God of life be with us on our journey. The blessing of the risen Christ be with us in our following. The blessing of the Holy Spirit be with us in our questioning. The blessing of the heavenly host be with us in our worshiping. Bless us, O God, each hour, each day, each moment, that we shall walk and see with you. Amen. Amen.